Hi everybody, we, we're running a little late. If you could, if you could please sit down for me. Um, uh, I'm very pleased that uh, that got the blood pumping a little bit. And uh, as Fiona said, I think the, the steam was rising a little bit and, and there, there are disagreements. And what's astonishing is that the recommendations we've seen from, from different people are different. And, and all of this is based on evidence. And that's really why we're having the conference. Um, so I spoke to a good friend of mine, David Unwin, yesterday, and, and he's very conciliatory and, and collaborative. And he said to me, agreement is really good. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of agreement. If um, I'm going to ask you, who thinks uh, sugar sweetened beverages are not good for you? Hands up, please. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Um, and and so, so green vegetables. Who thinks green vegetables is a good thing? Fantastic, right? And, and oily fish, apologies to the vegetarians, oily fish, yes. So, so there, there is a little a glimmer of, of overlap that we have, right? And, and it's really good. And, and my hope with this conference is that that overlap with all the different diets that Matthias showed us, that that overlap grows slightly over time and, and we agree on, on certain foods that are good for us. Um, so I was in China last week, and I've been thinking about this conference for many months, and um, uh, I won't say that my, I see my boss in the back. Um, I've been doing a lot of other things too, but I have been thinking a lot about the conference. And uh, uh, I, w I was in a, in a city called Changsha in Hunan province in China at a Swiss Re conference, and <clears throat> I went to the most amazing place one afternoon. So this is Hunan University, and what you can see on the right over here is this is one of the plaques and uh, this university was founded in 976 AD. So it's been going for over a thousand years. It has never stopped, not for dynasty changes, for world wars, for nothing, right? It's been going for over a thousand years. Beautiful place. And um, uh, we went to kind of almost like a temple of knowledge where they have a whole lot of um, uh, Chinese uh, symbols and, and beautiful calligraphy and I saw this and I asked a colleague uh, uh, next to me, a, a Chinese colleague, what does that mean? And uh, my Chinese is a little rusty, so, so I had to get this verified. Um, I don't know if any of you can read uh, Chinese, but it struck me incredibly related to this conference and particularly related to this panel discussion. It says, seeking truth from facts, right? So, I mean, it's just wonderful. And, and when you look at what this panel is about and what evidence can we trust, that's really it, right? Because we want the truth. That's what we want. And it's not always easy to find the truth. So um, I'm going to begin. Fiona mentioned early on that we should mention our conflicts. Uh, I work for Swiss Re. Um, but uh, one of the other things, and, and John Ioannidis, of course, talks about this, is that our bias is also personal. So I will talk to you about my uh, dietary preference. I reduce carbohydrates significantly. I've been doing it for uh, quite a while, um, and I, I, f I feel good on it, but, but that's my choice, right? Um, and then in terms of what evidence do I believe we can trust? I don't know. And um, I, I really liked uh, Darius's uh, commentary in the beginning that there are pros and cons to all of them, and um, we need to take kind of what we can. Uh, it would be wonderful. We could do RCTs forever on people, but, but we can't. There, there are downsides to that. It's very costly. You don't have long-term long um, studies, whereas, of course, the observational studies are prone to, to potential uh, confounders, right? And it's association, not causation. So, so there are pros and cons to everything, but we need the answers, and I hope this panel can help us get there. So I, I'm going to sit down now so that the panelists can start speaking. I have a list of questions. Um, I hope I don't need to ask any of them because we really do want to include the audience and we want the audience to, to ask as many questions as possible. Um, Zoe asked me last night, what order am I going to go in? And I wasn't sure. And, and then I saw this morning in very good Swiss and Swiss re fashion. It's in alphabetical order. So uh, that's not <laughs> accidental. So I'm going to start on that side. The, the surnames are in alphabetical order. So um, I've asked the panelists to briefly introduce themselves, uh, mention their dietary preferences, uh, their conflicts of interests, and then very briefly answer the question, what evidence can we trust? Zoe, over to you. 
Thank you very much. Until about 2009, I had what my mother would describe as a proper job. I was an HR director for global organizations, blue chip organizations, and I had the opportunity in 2009 to make my passion my vocation. I'd written a book in 2004 called Why Do You Overeat When All You Want Is To Be Slim? And that had been a fascination of mine since being at Cambridge University. People don't want to be obese, and yet we have more than a third of the developed world's population who are suffering from that affliction. It doesn't make sense. So I now read, write, and talk about obesity, diet, and nutrition as a vocation. I have no third party organization conflicts of interest. I work for no other organization. I publish and write uh, content online and in print. And if individuals enjoy what I write, I get to put steak on the table. And if they don't, it's white pasta. So in 2012, having started on this new venture, I undertook a PhD and I used systematic review and meta-analysis to examine the evidence base, both RCT and epidemiological, for the dietary fat guidelines that were introduced in 1977 in the US and 1983 in the UK. And the particularly unique aspect of the PhD was that it went back to look at the evidence that was available at the time and concluded that the evidence simply was not there to introduce the total fat guideline of 30% and the saturated fat guideline of 10%. So that's what I do now. When John asked the question, what evidence can we trust? I find it easy to say, what can't we trust? I don't trust epidemiology. I find there are too many reports coming out on an every other week basis. One minute eggs are good for us, next minute eggs are bad for us. Apparently, if you eat red meat, it will increase your risk of Googling cat videos on YouTube. I mean, it's getting absurd. Um, I don't trust epidemiology. It's not getting anywhere close to the Bradford Hill criteria of the strength of the association before you then get near double, which would take you into the other eight Bradford Hill criteria. Interestingly, in this field, I don't trust RCTs because it's impossible to change just one thing. If we swapped out meat and put in cereals, we would change all macronutrients and all micronutrients. The simplest RCT we can do is to swap out one oil for another. We change all three fats and we likely change plant sterols, which will directly impact cholesterol and confound the results. So I don't trust RCTs. So what do I trust? I trust non-findings, and we don't take non-findings seriously enough. So in the Hooper study of dietary fat and, and the uh, RCTs, there are 11 out of 12 non-findings, which we don't often enough talk about. We continually talk about the one finding of cardiovascular events, which when put under scrutiny itself falls away. And at the end of the day, what I do trust is not so common sense. And I kind of think if we could only just eat what we've been eating for the last three and a half million years, we've obviously done a lot better on plants and animals and anything we could gather or catch than we have on Twinkies or anything that's in the supermarket today. So that drives my own eating habits. My eating habits can be summed up as I eat real food. Uh, to the keto community, I'm probably quite high carb and low fat. To the government community, I'm definitely low carb and high fat. So that's what I eat, real food. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, thank you, Zoe. Asim. Uh, my name is Asim Alhotra. I am a consultant cardiologist. I've been a qualified doctor for almost 17 years. Um, I uh, wrote a book recently called The Piopi Diet. That's my declaration of interest. However, um, although I may have an intellectual conflict, I don't think I have a financial one. I hope I don't, as I'm giving all the proceeds and royalties for the book to the Academy of Medical Oncology's Choosing Wisely campaign, which also is in conjunction with the BMJ, because I think that's extremely important. Now, what evidence can we trust? Well, the first thing I can say, and Zoe's already alluded to it, is the fact that we have more than 60% of our adult UK population in many Western countries overweight or obese. And the huge burden of chronic disease, for me, is a clear indication that we have failed. We are failing our patients, and we are failing in our healthcare system. And the question is, why? Well, the father of evidence-based medicine movement, David Sackett, you know, I always come back to my patients, because ultimately, as a first line, as a, as a frontline doctor, my responsibility is to do what's best for my patients. 
And to practice evidence-based medicine, you need to use your individual clinical expertise, which we all do as doctors, the best available evidence that we have, and most importantly, patient preferences and values. I'm going to come on to that a little bit later, why the, how important that is in all of this. But the reality, the sad reality is that the best available clinical evidence, sadly, has been hijacked by commercial influence. Now, we'll hear from John Ioannidis later on, and I defer to him in terms of how we can improve the data quality, but the fact that from his analysis that even for medical therapeutic interventions, only 7% are estimated to actually fulfill criteria for being both high quality and relevant to patients is really a big wake-up call. When I started my journey uh, along the way, I wrote a quite a controversial paper in 2013 in the BMJ called Saturated Fat is Not the Major Issue. And for my own observations, I had concluded that a root cause behind this epidemic of, of obesity and type 2 diabetes was fatally flawed science. When I say fatally flawed science, I think our huge campaign that had been going on for quite some time to reduce cholesterol and saturated fat has failed to curb the epidemic of heart disease. And it's increased our consumption of ultra-processed foods, predominantly refined carbohydrates and sugar. And for me, when you look at the data now, the elephant in the room is that we are ignoring the most important risk factor for heart disease, which is insulin resistance. And I wrote an editorial with, with Rita Redberg and Pascal Meyer uh, last year in the British Journal of Sports Medicine saying we need to shift the paradigm because actually if we concentrate on insulin resistance, 66% of people admitted with heart attacks now have the insulin resistance syndrome. Through lifestyle changes, that's going to be the most important way to tackle obesity and chronic disease. I know we're running out of time. I know a lot of the discussion in the next few days is going to be a little bit about placing low carb versus low fat. And um, you know, there's been some great results from the direct study from Rod Taylor and Mike Lean to show that type 2 diabetes can be put into remission. However, is there another way? Or is there perhaps a better way? Well, data from Verta and diabetes.co.uk show that 25 to 50% of people involved in a low carb real food program, which is at, without restricting calories, actually um, puts patients into remission as well. So the question then is, where do we stand? Well, I think one thing that's going to emerge soon, and I hope everyone will pay attention to this, is that two Cochrane researchers and Professor Hannah Pell, diabetologist, is here in the audience today, uh, are about to publish a systematic review looking at low carb versus low fat for type 2 diabetes and looking at quality of life, cardiovascular risk factors, and glucose control. And I don't know the results, but if the results show at least equivalence or even that the low-carb approach is better, I believe that we should be using that as a first-line approach for our patients. And I'm just going to finish with one very quick... Um, uh, I received a... Um, talking about patient ve values and preferences. I just want to read this from someone who posted on my Facebook today. So it's an N equals one, but it's just to give the um, example of, of patient preferences and values about the best approach to tackle this. Okay, so watch tonight's episode of The Fast Fix. Four weeks in a lab with powdered shakes. They all still had, low, still had low mood, motivation, energy. Sending them home for another four weeks of powder shakes. No nutritional education whatsoever. Setting them up to fail by using fear tactics. Not a sensible way to develop a good relationship with healthy eating, living. Feeling very annoyed and frustrated at the moment. By the way, I reversed my type 2 diabetes by eating meat, fat, leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, nuts, berries, dairy, and a glass of good red wine, red wine on the weekend. They can keep their shakes. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Asim. Rita. Hi, I'm Rita Redberg. I'm a cardiologist at uh, University of California, San Francisco, and I'm also editor of JAMA Internal Medicine. Um, my own eating, I would say, is Mediterranean diet, um, largely very vegetarian, actually, because 10 to 15 years ago when my older daughter, who's here today, um, was vegetarian, it was simplest for us all to eat that way. And then I also, well, thanks partly to her, learn. It's not just, I think, better for you, as we've talked about, but also better for the environment in the world because of the incredible energy inefficiency from um, eating meat um, cows and the methane contribution and all the issues of climate change, which Jerry um, referred to also in your introductory remarks. And also living in Northern California, you know, we can, um, I, I'm basically mostly fruits and vegetables that we either grow um, at this time of year or that I can get from the local farmer's market. Because Barbara Kingsolver's book actually that where she, I thought she can eat locally from Northern Virginia, I could certainly eat mostly locally um, from living in uh, where I do, which is so. 
that's on my uh, diet. In terms of conflicts of interest, um, nothing except what I already listed um, with the journal. In terms of sources of evidence that we can trust, you know, I think uh, for the food industry, just as um, for the medical profession, I look a lot at uh, funding and where were studies funded. And this point was really driven home to, home to me in terms of the food industry when uh, we, JAMA Internal Medicine, published a paper two years ago, actually from some of my colleagues at UCSF, Kristen Kearns and Stan Glantz on the sugar industry and sort of the history of how the sugar industry had a major role in the papers that suggested that the real culprit in terms of heart disease was fat and they were actually funding research, funding some uh, researchers from Harvard in particular without disclosures, which weren't routine at that time because they had actually gotten documents um, through Freedom of Information Act request that looked at correspondence from the 50s and 60s between the Sugar Research Foundation and these researchers to basically try to suppress the evidence that was clear about the role of sugar in diet and heart disease and to sort of shift the focus onto fat. And clearly, you know, then the whole low fat movement and it's unsuccessful really, pop, the popularity, but it's lack of success in reducing heart disease, I think stemmed a lot from that kind of work. And so I think, um, and part of their conclusion was that you have to be careful of sources of funding and sources of funding should be transparent as well as data should be transparent. And I think that's as true or more true for food research as it is for medical research. I will say, as um, Asim has alluded to, I think currently in medicine we spend a lot um, more time focusing on medicines and not enough on diet and lifestyle. And as a cardiologist, I'm more often talking to people about what they're eating and the kind of exercise they can do and you know, not smoking than I am about, in, in particular, statins, which maybe we'll talk more about later, but I think and even when I talk about food, I talk about you know real food and not the, all the vitamins and pills. I think people have still a very mistaken idea that you can replace or supplement healthy eating by taking pills, and that's why we have this multi-billion dollar supplement industry, and I don't think that there's data to support that. I think that to stay healthy and get the benefits, it has to come from actual eating of real foods, as Zoe said. So I'll look forward to more discussion on all those points. Thanks very much. Gary. Okay, my name is Gary Taubes. I'm uh, a journalist. A, uh, I've written books which are on diet and health, which are conflicts of interest. I've co founded a not for profit that I'm now president of called the Nutrition Science Initiative, which was founded to uh, fund and facilitate clinical trials that we thought could resolve many of the issues in the field. Um, I actually personally funded Kristen Kearns to get the documents that Rita was talking about, the sugar industry. Um, briefly about my background, I was an investigative science reporter. My specialty was bad science, what physicists would call pathological science, which is the science of things that aren't so. So if you think about the first principle of science, which the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman described as you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool, pathological science by that definition is science that's been done by people who don't think they're fooling themselves and don't think they're easy to fool. And as such, uh, in the early 90s, I got into public health and my first major article in the field was on uh, chronic disease epidemiology. Uh, it was relatively infamous, and it was the paper you cited before John Ioannidis came along, in effect, to <laughs> take over for me. Um, I had issues with nutritional epidemiology in general because mo much of the rigor and critical science that I had been taught had to be done by my mentors in the physics and chemistry industry uh, was considered a luxury in uh, or at least from my perception was considered a luxury in the world of nutritional epidemiology because it's simply too hard to do. 
And as such, I've always been a critic of that. So when it comes to the question of what science we should believe or what evidence we should believe, uh, to me, nutritional epidemiology, epidemiology in general gives us associations between or correlations between diet and health. It doesn't give us causation. When I first wrote my piece, epidemiology reached its limit for the journal Science. Back in 93, these associations were considered de facto logically hypothesis generating. And to me, they're still logically de facto hypothesis generating. And yet even at a meeting like this, I see people using the risk factor epidemiology, the chronic diseases correlations and implying causality sort of in passing. And I find that deeply troublesome. So I find, in fact, the, from my journalistic perspective, the field, uh, deeply troublesome. It's true that randomized clinical trials are also flawed, but I don't believe that two flawed sources of evidence can be used to equal one truth in any way that they're <laughs> interpreted. Um, as for uh, along the way, uh, my evolution in this field, uh, I also did another infamous article for the New York Times Magazine, a cover story called What If It's Been a Big Fat Lie? that was started out as an investigation of what might have caused the obesity epidemic. In the course of that research, I came upon what to me is the most important data in this field, which are the clinical trials of low carbohydrate, high fat diets. So you have, based on in large part nutritional epidemiology, you had these uh, hypotheses that say that plant-based diets are better than animal product-based diets for your health, clearly not for the animals, but for your health. And low-fat diets or polyunsaturated fat-rich diets are better than saturated fat-rich diets. And calorie-restricted diets are better than ad libitum diets because we get fat clearly because we eat too much. And you do a randomized controlled trial where you compare a Back then in 2002, these were all known as Atkins diets. So you compare a diet that's rich in saturated fat, rich in animal products, in theory rich in calories, uh, but carbohydrate restricted to what were then just low fat American Heart Association control diets, which are calorie restricted and low in fat. And you would expect, based on your hypothesis, that these Atkins-like diets would kill people and would lead to more weight gain because they're ad libitum. And in all these cases where these studies are done, you see not only do they improve lipid profiles with the unfortunate exception of LDL cholesterol, but people lose uh, weight compared to the calorie restricted low fat diet. So for my take on this, this was the anomalous observation in the science. This is the observation that today we're still wrestling with. When I see a presentation in which, based on nutritional epidemiology, we should be telling everyone, including the 30 to 40 percent of the population that's obese and the 60 percent that's overweight and the 10 percent that's diabetic, they should be eating whole grains and fruit, and they're healthier if they do that than if they don't. I want to ask myself, how do they know? What's the evidence? If I have a child who's overweight and obese, overweight or obese, I want to know, are they really going to be healthier if I feed them a Mediterranean diet or a Swiss diet? If I feed them a diet rich in whole grains and fruits and vegetables, I believe one of the speakers said we should flood. What was the word it was you, Dari? Should we flood the, an excess of fruits, vegetables, whole grains? Is that really healthier? And then the question becomes, how do we know? And the only way I know to answer the how do we know question is with a clinical trial. And it's true that all the clinical trials to date have been flawed. But the question is, can they be done better? And can we find the societal will to do them better? And that's my, and along the way, I, I gave up starches and grains because I find that they make me fatter. So. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Thank you very much. Walter. Sure. Um, I guess in terms of conflict of interest, I'm I basically a descendant of five generations of Michigan dairy farmers. And I grew up um, in that context, uh, drinking many glasses of milk a day and uh, for uh, eating mashed potatoes, roast beef, and gravy. Uh, but uh, as the evidence came in, my diet has shifted pretty far away from that. And I can say it's much more enjoyable. It's, I'm, I'm an omnivore, but 
uh, a more Mediterranean type diet with um, largely plant-based. And I think um, Zoe's wrong, I, although I agree she was right when she started looking at the data in the early 1990s, this recommendation to consume low fat, high, higher carbohydrate diets was not supported by any evidence at all. In fact, what I realized at that time was that there was pretty much almost no evidence on the long-term consequences of diet, which is why we set up our long-term cohort studies uh, beginning in 1980 to actually track people's diets and what happens to them. And uh, that has clearly shown that low-fat diets are, in general are not beneficial, but that the type of fat and the type of carbohydrate is, is very important. And uh, both uh, Jenny Brand Miller and Nita, I think, showed that evidence in a very clear way. And also the point that uh, there, in some ways, we shouldn't trust without uh, question any study, any line, any type of study. We should look at every study critically. Uh, and they are all going to be imperfect. We have to live with this. You can wait for Gary to do the perfect study, but I can tell you it'll be dead first. Uh, and your, probably your grandchildren will be as well. And we we're, really will have to rely on the combination of all of the evidence weighing its strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I think Zoe is wrong that epidemiology studies are all over the place, you, in, inconsistent. If you read a lot of uh, newspapers and radio, you will maybe get that impression uh, because they're always hyping the latest study that's different from anything else and never rarely publish a confirmatory study. And they're often, these are the, often the weakest evidence, uh, weakest studies that are being cited. And I totally sympathize with the public uh, in terms of being confused. I would be confused if, that, if I didn't know much deeper the evidence. But like Dr. Schultz showed, that if you look at the Mediterranean diet observational studies, uh, there were about 15, and not a single one showed a positive association. And uh, they consistently showed uh, inverse associations and also consistent with a randomized trial uh, part of med study for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So the reality is that uh, sort of the newer generation of large cohort studies uh, produces findings that are uh, very consistent. Uh, I've uh, started and have been part of the diet and cancer pooling project that combines the data from all the large cohort studies from around the world to look at various aspects of diet and cancer. And it really is impressive uh, how consistent the data are when you uh, look, line up all of the studies um, here using the, the primary data that are uh, often not published as well as the published results. Uh, very consistent findings. Uh, now, is that uh, there's still potential for confounding? We should also look at that critically. But when you do combine that, as uh, again, others have made the point already, uh, controlled trials of intermediate risk factors uh, and combine that with the longitudinal epidemiologic studies, we reach a, a high level of certainty. And certainty is really a continuum. And we are, uh, as where there may start from a neutral position, but as the evidence piles up, we can get closer and closer to a high level of certainty. We probably will never get to 100%. You can have the world's perfect randomized trial, but it, 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 they'll never be perfect for all the reasons that have been mentioned. But um, even that, that, you can still have chance findings, uh, and, and we cannot be 100% sure of, uh, of, of truth. But in many of these areas, uh, we uh, can get to a high degree of certainty. Uh, another example, uh, in, in addition to a couple of those that have been made already, is um, on trans fat, which we started working on in the 1970s. And uh, Dari actually has uh, summarized that evidence nicely in a New England Journal paper that we have the data from multiple cohort studies showing uh, consistently and uh, in the overall meta-analysis, uh, robust associations with coronary heart disease. And we have randomized controlled trials uh, of feeding studies uh, over a period of a few weeks showing adverse effects on blood lipid and, and inflammatory factors and APOE, uh, uh, excuse me, LDL particle size, all consistently showing adverse associations. And you put those controlled feeding studies together with the uh, large cohort studies, and uh, you can reach a high level of certainty. You can always make an objection about no, not one of those studies is perfect, but the, the uh, 
the, the, the weight of the evidence is clearly that trans fats have harmful effects, and on that basis, we've removed them from the food supply in the U.S. Pretty much it'll be Ill illegal in the United States uh, next Monday to, to produce trans fats. Uh, so, and there are many other examples. Uh, and in some ways, this is uh, the fact that we can't do randomized trials is uh, not unique. Uh, and we, in courts of law, we make decisions without randomized trials, you know, thousands of decisions every day on the weight of evidence. Uh, anybody here, how many people here believe that climate change is happening and affected by human activity? Uh, uh, they, they, most people do. And uh, can you imagine doing a randomized trial on climate change? Uh, we, uh, it, the, the bigger the question, often it's uh, it more difficult to mm. do randomized trials. That, it's a paradigm uh, that we should use every time we can, but uh, and much of the time we just simply can't. And uh, the more, even worse than that, we can often get uh, the wrong answer, and that's the worst consequence, that the, the most powerful risk factor we have is smoking. And the randomized trials of smoking cessation and mortality show no benefit. Uh, do you really believe that? Of course not, nobody believes that. But if you're really stuck with randomized trials, they reproducibly show no benefit, which is, uh, again, why every study has to be looked at uh, critically. Okay. Uh, so I'll stop I, there. I, yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry, so. Can we respond? Um, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll let the panel just respond to each other a little bit and then we, we'll open it up. So uh, um, you, you would all make terrible Swiss um, because your timekeeping to three minutes has been <laughs> appalling. But um, absolutely, go ahead, Gary. John, I'd love to make just one quick point because I was the main uh, focus of attack, I think, from uh, my learned colleague at the end of the row here. Um, the particular point that I'm making with epidemiology is that we do have the Bradford Hill criteria from 1965, and epidemiology is not getting into that strength of association of 100% or a factor of two. It's not even getting close. The studies that we're seeing are 10% difference. You quoted PREDIMED, which will quote the relative risk of 30%, which is actually three in a thousand person years. So we're playing with the numbers. They're tiny. I don't think we have that power of evidence. That's my defense back on that one. Uh, well, that's silly. If you believe a 30% increase or a decrease in heart disease risk is not important, but so be it. We'd make lots of decisions. And that, it, it, that translates, if you look at heart disease risk, into many tens of thousands of cases per year. Yeah, it, okay. it's, it is important. So Walter and I were co-authors with Nita Faruhi and, and Ron Krauss, who's not here, on the, on the dietary fat article. And this, um, this dynamic has played out over the course of the year, I think. <laughs> uh, many, we had, uh, you know, documents in edit mode that Nita must have That's taken. Yeah, no, I think if, if, and if, if there are uh, long-term consequences to aspirin use, to deal particularly with my comments. Um, I, I find Walter's arguments, and he knows this, and we've fought about this publicly and privately, um, sophistic on, on many levels. So this isn't climate change. So when we're talking about climate change, whether you believe it or not, yes, it's true, we have one Earth. And it's always a reasonable thing to say it's because we don't know what's going to happen that we should act to prevent it is a completely reasonable assumption. In this case, when we're talking about diet and health, there are, and even cigarettes, it's a, it's a separate issue. So whether or not cigarettes cause lung cancer, removing cigarettes from your lifestyle seems to be a reasonable thing to do that is not going to cause harm. And back in 1981 in the British Medical Journal, there was a seminal article written on um, uh, 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 public health uh, uh, epidemiology uh, and, and uh, the argument made was that, and this is in our dietary fat argument, that if you're arguing to uh, remove an unnatural aspect of the environment or the diet or the lifestyle because you will be healthier, that's a reason why you can make on a public health benefit. So you can argue to remove trans fats. That's one reason why I don't disagree because trans fats are certainly an unnatural aspect of our diets. You can argue to remove cigarettes because cigarettes are not a, something we've been consuming for two and a half million years, as, as Zoe put it. You can argue, back when we did argue to remove saturated fat, part of the basis of that argument was that the high levels of saturated fat or high levels of fat in the diet were unnatural. It was a, based on questionable 
or, or deb debatable assessments of paleolithic diets, but that was the argument. When you're arguing something based on epidemiology that we should all eat, for instance, plant oils instead of animal fats, now you're arguing that we should eat something that's relatively new to human diets, uh, many of the plant oils that we consume, or if you're arguing that and we should remove uh, animal fats, which are, have been in human diets, depending on form, for, again, millions of years. So that's a fundamentally different argument. And the way I think about it is I think, in effect, what I'm being told on a base level is I'm feeding my children right now. I'm one of these people who thinks butter's a health food, and I hope I'm right. And I can act like that in my own family. I don't think I'm doing my children harm, but I'm being told that if I switch them from butter to corn oil or soy oil or rapeseed oil, they will live longer. And I have no way to know. I will never know, in fact, whether they're right. If my kids live to be 90, I won't know if they live to be 100 if they had stayed on butter. It's a, it's a <laughs> hypothesis that I'm being asked to act on. And before I act on that hypothesis, I want to know, I want to have harder evidence than when we look at healthy people in populations and we compare them to unhealthy people. Um, Jenny made this point discussing carbohydrates. I forget what it was, but people who eat white bread are very different than people who don't. And people who eat vegetarian diets are very, or plant-based diets are very different than people who eat meat-rich diets. And people who eat sugar-based diets are very different than people who avoid sugar. And we may be comparing incomparable people. People who have a whole, and I hope John Ioannidis will talk about this, a whole universe of factors that go with these things. And I want to, I want to have better evidence before okay. I switch Derry, my kids' Derry. diet. Walter, well, do you want to have a quick, yeah, just, quick word? But, okay, and then well, we, we have to keep the answer short, please. Yeah. Right. I'm not going to report here for child abuse, but feeding your daughter butter, but no, uh, son, 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 okay, either. Well, but are we on uh, that but, track? but uh, you do have quite a bit of evidence uh, that uh, uh, the controlled feeding studies, uh, your uh, son would have clearly better lipids, uh, and I'm expanding no, this to other animal fats. Uh, he will have just as good other lipid fractions. Uh, uh, with, if you want a long-term uh, test of thousands of years, you can use olive oil. Uh, that's readily available. Uh, these plant oils, these are not, they're not like trans fat. These have been part of our diet, maybe not in quite the amounts, but it, it's a, it's a, it, they, they have been part of our human diet. They're not artificial chemicals like trans fats were. And we have long-term studies uh, showing uh, uh, that substitution of animal fats, including butter, with plant oils is related to lower risk of cardiovascular disease. So there's a lot of weight of evidence, whether it's controlled feeding studies, metabolic studies, long-term epidemiologic studies, and randomized trials that Nita talked about that, uh, that all are pointing in the direction, maybe not 100% causality, but all the evidence of different kinds points out, uh, points that uh, re replacing animal fats with plant oils will be better. Now, you can say it's imperfect, and no one of these studies is perfect, but uh, there's nothing pointing the other way, except you argue for his ecological or historical uh, precedence. But uh, in fact, what you're describing uh, is the, the Finnish diet of the, of the 1960s, which was very high in animal fat. And if you want to go to the ecological size, it's the weakest kind of evidence, but the high Did plant oil does. We, we can, we can, we can, I'm going to stop it there. Yeah. Um, sorry, yeah. can, can I stop it there? Because this is going yeah. into, into a, a rabbit hole of, of, um, yeah. of dietary fat. And uh, we're going to open we it to the audience. So let's have um, uh, two or three questions. Uh, if you can take the um, mics to a couple of people with their hands up um, and, and have over there. Yeah, go ahead. Just okay. Uh, yes. Let him go first, please. Stand up. Okay. Does that help? Sure. Just introduce yourself very briefly and ask the question very okay. briefly, please, um, and and to who you might be um, wanting okay. an answer. Not sure who it's attached to yet. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Amanda Atkins. I am former reinsurance director, actually, so I have an interest, um, but uh, also a diabetic. I was diagnosed with 10.3 HbA1c 18 months ago. It's now 5.3, based on a low-carb, high-fat diet. Um, I chose to do that based on a randomized control study that I saw. I found out about this industry after that. 
My question is, there are thousands of people like me who have changed their diet to low carb, <coughs> high fat because you're eating less carbs. Uh, all of them have got lipid profiles that show improving lipid profiles, improving heart profiles, improving liver, lung, kidney function, you name it. What is the, the role of N equals one people who are actually doing these diets and who are actually changing their health? They have got real data. They have got information that they can give to the medical community, to the scientific community, that can help them choose what to study next. Why are you guys not making the best use of all of that actual data from individuals via what is now available on the internet? Okay, thank you. The question over there. Sorry. Just... Uh, you, you... Yes, Martin Sebus. Uh, I have a. Uh... Like Amanda, I have reversed my diabetes on a low-carb diet, so I'll declare that interest. But my question's away from that. Uh, I have a, uh, a background in business, and we're seeking truth from facts. I just want to put a fact up and then uh, ask a question. Very quickly. Please. Yeah, very quickly. The fact is that no corporation can spend money unless it's in the interests of the corporation. Okay? It's, it's, it's against corporate law. Um, it's bad to spend it on yourself, but it's, if it's also bad not to spend it for the benefit of the corporation. That means increasing sales. My question is, if we're trying to improve uh, research, um, has it been considered to set up a journal in, analogous to Cochrane that sets up a rule that says there will be no um, corporate-influenced um, research in this journal? It's a good question. Let's have one third one, and then we'll... Yeah, so the I'm David Sitar from Glasgow University. I'm a professor of metabolic medicine. So I, I really enjoyed this, um, and I thought, Walter, you did a really nice job of you know, giving balanced um, comments to the others. And there was some evidence of observational associations that others were presenting. Now, I think we're getting slightly mixed up. One, there's cardiovascular outcomes, and there's two, there's obesity. And, you know, there's kind of orthogonal conversations that happen, and Walter, you know, you know this well. And I think the key other aspect, I think, Gary, you made, you know, it, ad libitum low-fat diets, or, sorry, low-carb diets, Yes, they can have ad libitum, but actually what the evidence is, they end up eating less calories because it gives you more satiety. And the key thing is it's not necessarily sustainable over the long term. And I think um, our colleague from Sydney said that as well. So I completely accept that low-fat, low-carb diets will make you lose weight just as well as low-fat diets. We know that. There's a randomized you know, meta-analysis in JAMA that shows that. It's a question of what is the question you're after and what's the long-term sustainability of that um, answer as well. So, and I think those things, I think we need to just um, be mindful of. Thanks very much. So, uh, I'm going to jump, Rita, to you regarding uh, the question about uh, a journal uh, and, and not allowing funding from outside vested interests. Your comment on that? Right. So, certainly, you know, all or most journals, there are a lot of newer and some predatory journals, but most of the journals that follow ICMJ, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editor, have conflict of interest policies. But that's different from what you're saying is not taking funding. You know, that's, um, I think we're probably all variable and people have looked at it. The policies only mandate disclosure of conflicts of interest so that if this study was funded, I can say, speaking from my own journal, we, we always look at the source of funding for a study and in, because you want to know that the there wasn't undue influence and bias. And that doesn't mean we would never publish an industry, and it's usually pharmaceutical industry funded study, but we want particular assurance that it was independently um, analyzed, that the, it was independent, and that, that the findings are free of bias. And that's certainly a big concern. But I would say, in general, that is a big concern, particularly as I said, pharmaceutical and some for food industry. As well, because you're right, everyone is, you know, uh, responsible to their shareholders, and not, and even the way research questions are formed, um, have a lot to do with the kind of answer you're giving it and your funding source. So it's really important to look at. But they're just not. There's not a lot of independent sources of funding. So a journal that didn't publish any studies that are industry funded has a very limited. You know, we have government source of funding, and, and that's about it. And even government, you know, at least in NIH, is often partnering with industry. And so, 
I, I would like to see more. I think you know it's great to have this conference and talk about it. I mean, I think part of the reason that in medicine we're talking so little about lifestyle, which is so important in health, and so much about drugs and pills as the solution is because that's where the money is in medicine. It, the money is in, you know, the uh, Rita, can, can I jump in with a quick, a quick question? Should, should the reviews of what is published not be more um, unbiased and objective? So, so I, you know, I know Zoe is very good at, at doing um, investigations and, and, and literally ripping apart uh, systematic reviews and, and going through them very carefully in, in a quite an unbiased way because she, she looks at, at, at all studies from all, from all sides. Should should journals not make uh, uh, the review process more onerous and, and unbiased? Is that a possibility? You mean the peer review process yeah. to be more um, unbiased? And, and more rigorous? Is that, or is, or is that unreasonable? Not unreasonable. No. Ah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so, maybe so, if he so wants Fiona, to comment. the people she, live stream, but uh, Fiona Godley just says not unreasonable at all. Yeah. No. And, I mean, certainly and I, we and I think, I'm sure BMJ and a lot of other journals, we avoid reviewers that have conflicts of interest. We ask people to disclose. But again, I mean, we're not the FBI. I mean, we don't investigate. We rely on people to be yeah, yeah. honest. And, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, they didn't disclose. And then and maybe we'll get into it. But there's a lot of discussion over intellectual conflicts of interest and financial conflicts of interest. and. We certainly try to avoid it. I think journals could certainly be better and be more open. I think, and maybe feel common, BMJ uses an open reviewer con where you can see who review. Yeah. We um, offer reviewers the opportunity to be open, but they don't have to say if they're open. The data I've seen don't suggest that there's a difference in the quality of the review, but you're trusting a lot to the editors mm -hmm. and the reviewers. So I'm, I'm just going to, the other two questions were both related to low carb. There's a low carb panel discussion this afternoon. So I'm going to take those because this is meant to be about what evidence can we trust. So I'm going to try and just keep the focus a little bit. Um, go ahead over there. Yeah, I'm Tim Key from Oxford University in Britain. Uh, two comments and a question. I mean, I just want to challenge a couple of the statements from the panel. Dr. Malhofter has said that the changes in diet have had, you know, have failed to reduce the risk of ischemic heart disease. I think that the facts just show the opposite. The rates of heart disease have gone down in all Western countries. Some of that is diet, some of it is drugs, smoking, etc. Um, Zoe Harkham accused the Sacken Committee in the UK of being completely biased due to one committee member who works for industry which is a requirement of the committee to have a, a member from industry. As a member of that committee, I find it totally outrageous to claim that the whole committee's conclusion has been swayed by one person who works for industry. If that were the only conflict on the panel from industry, I would accept that accusation, but it's not. A few people speaking this afternoon have shown adverse associations of high meat intakes, not only processed meat, also red meat with diabetes and ischemic heart disease, um, and a point that's really been glossed over in the arguments for reducing carbohydrate intake is there's a large body of research in vegetarian cohorts showing very consistently in the Western populations, in the US, in Europe, that vegetarians have a relatively high intake of carbohydrate, higher than any of the other groups, the meat eaters, fish eaters in these studies. They have a high intake of carbohydrate, they have a much uh, significantly lower body mass index, lower blood pressure, and lower risk of ischemic heart disease. Maybe they're choosing particularly good carbohydrates. Sorry, I think you should do you bear have a that question? In mind I'm, I'm just when you of time. Um, suggest that you know that low carbohydrate is always better because these people are eating more and they're doing better than the people who are eating less. Sorry, was there was there a question? <laughs> <laughs> the question was. Um, do the people who argue for Quickly, eating less please. carbohydrate, how do they explain these observations in vegetarians who have a particularly high intake okay. of carbohydrates? Thank you. The healthy wait, wait, hang on, we're just going to have the other question. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. David McCarran, I'm an adjunct professor at UC Davis, um, a nephrologist by training, which I think helped me as I wandered into nutrition. I radicalized. Gary Tobbs in 1998, so Walt, you can blame me. Uh, the question to the panel actually addresses the topic up there. Um, 
The DASH diet was described by our program in 1984 in the science paper. It was not low fat and it was not low sodium. You can go look at the paper clearly. The diet got described by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute arbitrarily as low fat and then got described by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute as a low sodium diet. And while we have these concerns about corporations, which I agree, there are many, I think most of you might be concerned, that our governments have caused some of the problems we're, we're addressing here. And we have to get back to that. And I just wonder how the panel feels about that. Great, thank you very much. So we'll have one, one more question. Uh, so hang on, wait for, the, um, wait for the mic, please. It's a methodological comment as opposed to any particular nutrient. Uh, as many of you know, sorry. Okay, I, I'm Salim Yusuf from McMaster University, uh, representing the low and middle income countries, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, as many of you know, my first two thirds of my career, and still, I was doing large randomized trials. In the last 25 years, we've been doing epidemiology, and with Walter's help, we got into nutrition epidemiology because of our interest in ethnicity, and then the Pure study, the Interheart study, and the Interstroke study. I've randomized over half a million people into trials, and I've included nearly half a million people into epidemiological study. So I sit between <laughs> these two gentlemen here. I, I'd like to say the real evidence is when there's a coherence of information from different methodologies. Every methodology has its limitations. And I, I think we can criticize them till the cows come home. I think though there is something useful to think, there are two principles to think about. Anything physiological will follow a U-shaped curve. It's there in your textbook, Walter. If you reduce something that people normally eat for millions of years down into their boots, you're going to get into trouble. If you give them too much of it, they're going to get into trouble. So our starting point in nutritional epidemiology, not for the external toxins, but for the internal things we eat, has to be the U-shaped curve. Unfortunately, our epidemiological studies haven't had the diversity or the size to generally affect them. That's one. External toxin. Remember, Bradford Hill's work and Rose's work was based on occupational uh, and, uh, toxins. There, you can start to believe you see harm, and it wasn't to see benefit. Uh, Rose said if you get an odds ratio more than two, you can believe it less than that, you can't. The problem is if the collectivity of diet reduces risk by 30%, each component has to be some fraction of it. It's very hard to have to control biases to such an extent that your confounding is a fraction of 15%. So you do need both trials and epidemiology, but epidemiology has to evolve to a whole different plane of using what we call instrumental variable analysis, like Mendelian randomization. So my, I would urge people, yes, thank you, John. I would <laughs> shut up and sit down in a minute. I would urge people, this debate, epidemiology versus RCTs, will never go away. But try to find where can each complement each other. Uh, So, so we have a few minutes, and it's a pity we do, because that would have been a, a really beautiful conclusion. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to give 30 seconds, please, if you can very just... Very quickly, to respond to yeah. the gentleman over there about cardiovascular disease mortality reduction because of diet. Certainly, trans fat seems to be consistent. We know that smoking reduction, 50% at least of cardiovascular death rates were reduced because of smoking. People talk about cholesterol and statins. How many people here think that um, statins have reduced cardiovascular mortality in secondary prevention in the population? OK, quite a few hands raised, raised here. Well, they haven't. They haven't. There was a study, study published in the BMJ 2016, observational across 
12, uh, European countries, 12 years, no reduction in cardiovascular death rates. Is that because of scientific fraud? No. The science explains that if you look at the actual median increase in life expectancy in industry-sponsored trials, highly selected patients, median increase is only 4.2 days. More than 50% of patients stop their statins in secondary prevention after two years. As a cardiologist that's prescribed these like Smarties, there's a big problem there. So you can explain the science. So it hasn't done, certainly in my view, cholesterol lowering the population through diet or drugs has failed to reduce cardiovascular mortality in the population. That's my interpretation. Um, okay, so uh, over there at the back, Amanda, is that your hand? Um, so um, I'm not in the medical profession, but in the mathematical profession. So maybe to get back to the topic of seeking the truth from facts. Um, what I'd like yourself. to, sorry? Sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, uh, Swiss Re, I'm the hub head for EMEA, so the, the actuaries and the underwriters um, uh, in my team. Um, getting back, and I'm also, um, I have a, a background in actual science and statistics. So the, the point of my question is, um, statistics can be manipulated, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and going back to what someone presented earlier in terms of the um, being able to re reproduce the information, how do we, and, and this is the question, how do we, in terms of answering this, provide the level of transparency and disclosure to those people who are interested so that we can draw our own conclusions from the data and the evidence, understanding both the limitations and the outcomes so that we are not necessarily being told but can draw our own conclusions from the analysis and the disclosures? Great. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Just wanted to comment that those who doubt the value of changing diet for cardiovascular disease shouldn't really forget the very massive reduction that was produced in Karelia in Finland when they went for the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, what, what, Walter or, or Gary, would, would one of you like to respond to, to the question about making the findings available in a way that is transparent for uh, other people to see the truth? Um, let's see. That. I'm not sure exactly what's requested there, that different people want to see the uh, findings in different forms. Some people want just a very simple bottom line. Other people uh, would like to know the methods deeper and I, more deeply. And I hope that that's what we do in the journals, that uh, the findings should be judged on the basis of uh, the methods, uh, oftentimes you'll have to go back, like in a, a saying that one of our studies uh, looking at diet, we've often published data, uh, separate papers before on the validity of the dietary measurements on the documentation of the endpoint. So it often will need to be, uh, be necessary to go back to other publications. We're only usually allowed 3,000 words or something like that in the journal. Sometimes supplementary documents more and more, since we can do that online, we're doing, uh, uh, in terms of disclosure, a conflict of interest, uh, those are there now. Um, uh, I think all journals require that. So I'm, if there's something more specific that's being asked for, I'd be happy to So, so, so Gary, that. do you think there's transparency in terms of what is published and, and that somebody like Amanda, who's very mathematical and statistical, can, can, can actually get to, there's, is there truth? There's different types of transparency. One of the issues always in the public health sphere, and this was set forth pretty clearly again in the 1980s, the kinds of changes we're talking about actually have, even though Walter will talk about 30% reductions in cardiovascular deaths, if this is correct and there's no unintended consequences, these actually translate to tiny effects in individuals. And it's not really well understood how it translates to tiny effects in individuals. So for instance, in the late 1980s, there were three studies done at Harvard, uh, McGill, and uh, UC San Francisco looking at just taking cholesterol levels, lowering them by as much as what an infected statin would do, and looking at how that would increase longevity in uh, humans using the Framingham data as the baseline. And the answer was that on average, we would all live, if we all cut our cholesterol, our uh, LDL cholesterol by 30 points, we would all live from one week to two months longer. And in fact, the U.S. Surgeon General tried to get to uh, convince JAMA not to publish the study that they funded because they didn't like the reply. So the way we deal with this as a public health organization is we don't talk about the individual benefits because we don't know what they are. And we play up the benefits to get everyone to embrace these 
lifestyle or diet changes such that we can get benefits over the population. And the same thing happens even when you tell people to uh, use seat belts, for instance. Only one in 600 or so on average will benefit from wearing seat belts over the course of our lifetime. But you tell everyone to do it so that one in 600 will actually be wearing his seat belt or her seat belt when she needs it. So there's some interesting philosophical approaches that lead us to not being open about actually the benefits if they're even real. And we discussed this when we wanted to write our paper. We suggested that maybe we could quantify, and Derry, I think you even asked this at one point, wouldn't it be good if we could quantify how much people would benefit if they replace, say, 5% of the saturated fats they consume with polyunsaturated fats, how much I or my sons, how much longer can we expect to live? And I'm pretty confident the number is infinitesimal. Okay, I'll respond to that. Just I'm, I'm just going to give Zoe a chance, and then Walter will get back to you. I just wanted 10 seconds on the North Karelia thing. The North Karelia situation is very interesting. In the Second World War, 400,000 people were displaced from that region. We also know from Glasgow that displacement is a significant factor in cardiovascular disease. So the death rates observed in the seven country study in that part, that particular cohort, were extraordinarily high. They were the highest in the whole of the seven country study cohorts. And of course, then they have to fall post that because you can't die twice. Well, yeah, okay. That's just but that, that it's also in the US, rates of coronary heart disease mortality have dropped by 75%. It's not just, uh, it's not so just Finland. Mortality, it's a, yeah. 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 So mortality. So I was going to give Rita a chance, and we get, I, we kind of, I'm going to get chartered at. Oh, I can carry on. I can carry on? Oh, no, I can't. <laughs> Um. I'll just, just briefly on, on the issue of data sharing, because I think that is an important topic. And I think the goal of uh, most journals, I would say, is that the methods should be clear, as someone said, so that you could reproduce the study. And that also means the data has to be available. There's a lot of discussion, again, in ICMJE. I think BMJ has really been a leader in sort of promoting a more broad interpretation of data sharing, but I don't think there's, there's not even consensus in ICMJE at this time on data sharing. So I think we're moving in that direction, and I think that is a very reasonable expectation, is that you should be able to into, you know, read the paper and then be able to look at the methods and re try to reproduce those results on your own. So um, I would uh, really like to uh, thank the panel. As uh, Fiona mentioned earlier, uh, we're not going to, this is not it, we're not going to get the final answer today or, or tomorrow. Um, it's a beginning of a discussion. So I'd really like to thank the panelists. Please join me.